Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video, I'm gonna be looking at Farid Responds and his particular way of trying to explain what the Aruf are and what the Kila'at are when it comes to the Quran. Now we've known for a long time that there isn't just one Quran, there are multiple Qurans in any way, shape or form that Muslims want to dress it up as because these different Qurans are both canonized and have differences in them, meaningful differences, not just slight changes of singular words, but sometimes the actual content changes. I did a video about this the last week or the week before. I'll link it up in the corner. You guys can check it out. Some of the differences like Surah 37, Ayah 12 and Surah 10, Ayah 16. So let's start by watching Farid. Let's check out some of the stuff he's done, trying to explain the very complicated and mysterious Aruf and Kala'at to us. Take it away, Farid. Now, it's important to keep in mind that uh, what are Ahruf and what are Qira'at, right? So first of all, what you need to know is um, through mutawatir reports, there are multiple mass transmitted reports from Rasulullah that says that the Quran was revealed in seven modes. So keep in mind, Farid is trying to explain how these Qira'at, these changes in the Quran are definitely not mistakes. They are 100% not mistakes, even if it's just tiny little changes in the dot that change the whole meaning, like in this example right here in the Arabic, it's still definitely not a mistake, even though it's the most easiest thing in the world to do and fits the criteria for a mistake in like every sense. But let's keep going. You'll find this in any book of Hadith. This isn't something that David Wood just discovered, guys. This is something that's been taught since day one in Islam, all right? Um, and basically, Rasulullah um, had the Quran revealed to him in seven modes to make the Quran easier to recite. And we're going to get to that. So did David would discover the seven modes, the aruf, that you can find in multiple hadith, like these ones. Like these ones. These ones. Somewhere. Somewhere on the screen there's going to be hadith. No, of course he didn't. But the overwhelming majority of Muslims do not know about this esoteric little treasure. Scholars have produced a wide variety of different explanations as to what the aruf are. None of them really know. And for that reason, it doesn't make much sense from a apologist perspective to try and explain that information to people long before they had the internet. But now people do have the internet and people do want to know why Muhammad decided to reveal the Quran in seven different ways. Is this something that really makes sense? Why would Muhammad decide to explain the same thing differently in different times he was asked? to different groups, because not every group is aware of the different aruf. That seems very odd, and there better be a good explanation. Otherwise, I'm going to take the simplest Occam's razor, you might say, explanation and say, this is simply just mistakes that have been introduced through the passage of time due to the fact that the Uthmanic reading was open to interpretation. But let's continue. Uh, now, what are the qira'at? The qira'at are not the ahruf. The qira'at are basically a combination of the ahruf, of the seven modes. So basically, if you hear half the Qur'an in mode one and the other half in mode two, and then you recite it in that manner, then you have Qira'a X. I hope it's not too confusing. But that's basically the idea of what a Qira'a is. It's just basically a combination of the modes. So Farid comes up with this little diagram where he tries to explain that the Qira'at and the Aruf are not the same thing. They are different from each other. But he tries to relate them, which I think is probably the best chance a Muslim apologist would ever have of explaining the Aruf by making some kind of connection between the seven different modes and the ten canonized Qira'at. But by doing so, he leaves us in a position where we have more questions than answers. Question one, why is it that there were seven different modes and yet the amount of Qira'at readings we have do not match those different modes? When we get to the 10th century, so 300 years after Muhammad at this point, we finally narrow it down to seven different Qur'an by Ibn Mujahid. Then, around 500 years after that, in the 15th century, we then have to make a concession and say, well, actually, it's not seven different Qur'an, it's ten different Qur'an. And we know for a fact that after that, there was a period where there was 14 known Qur'an readings that were being accepted. And yet four of these readings seem to have just fallen out of favor and no longer recited. How do we have any reassurance that whatever these different ways of reciting the Qur'an were, the different era of the seven different ways, how do we have any assurance that we can find all of those perfectly preserved in the Qur'at? We don't. We have no idea of this sort of thing. In fact, it seems likely that wherever there's variance in the ayah of disagreement that the scholars debate about, it seems likely that not in a single case, as far as I am aware, but we have good reason to say, yeah, all these go back to Muhammad. Muhammad said all seven of these different recitations. What do you do if you only have four? Isn't that kind of awkward? <laughs> I mean, think of it this way, right? Like, if you're reciting a particular ayah and you know there are variants in the ayah, there is different qura that says different things, they put diacritical marks in different places, which produce different words. 
and different meanings, and you only know of four of these, for example, how on earth is that seven? You now have to interject that when Muhammad said he, the Quran was revealed in seven modes, he didn't mean all of the Quran, he just meant very specific parts were? But to my knowledge, I don't know if there is even Kala'at that includes seven complete variants that are accepted and canonized. So you can't look at it on a per ayah basis, you have to look at it on a per surah basis maybe. But even then, I don't think there are surahs in which there are seven different accepted ways of reading it, because that is the qira'a, and that is standardized to ten now. The burden of proof is on the apologist like Farid to be able to show what the seven different modes are, so we know what this aruf actually is, what it applies to, what we can expect to find, and then after laying out that criteria, he then needs to demonstrate that this has been perfectly preserved in each of the Kira'at. If he wants to maintain that the Aruf is what basically builds up the Kira'at later on when the Kira'at gets canonized. I don't think he can actually do this, and this would be my challenge to him. Farid, if you're watching this, can you demonstrate to me the seven different modes are understood and known, and there is consensus ijma among scholars of Islam? Let's continue. Let's see what he says next. Secondly, historically, there's no doubt that the Kira'at existed among the Sahaba themselves. So is it possible that the Sahaba like completely forgot how to recite the Qur'an in one generation? We're not even talking about the Qur'an as a whole. At the moment, I'm just speaking about Al-Fatiha. Is it possible for the Sahaba to have completely forgotten how to recite the Fatiha? I mean, that's something that's simply too hard to swallow. So Farid makes this point that Surah Fatiha, the very first surah in the Qur'an that was standardized by Uthman, this surah is so well recited in everyday prayers, that there is no way that you could possibly introduce variants into it that were not known by the early Sahaba, by the companions of Muhammad. Okay, sure, but we've long since gone past this. I know that people talk about Maliki al Medin as the most common variant that is found in the Kala'a, but there are tons and tons more. Here's a quick list of some of those variants. And these are far more damaging than just the one we find in Ayah 4 of Surah Al-Fatiha. These are way more substantially different, and in some cases are just flat-out negations of other Qur'a of the same Ayah, like in Surah 10, Ayah 16. So appealing to the well-knownness of Surah Al-Fatiha is irrelevant. This occurs all over the Qur'an. You can find this, uh, as I've said in other videos as well, in the Bridges translation of the 10 Qur'a of the Noble Qur'an. It's translated there from different Arabic Qur'a into English, and you can see what they say. So just because someone somewhere recited something doesn't mean it gets into the Quran and it's accepted. The reason why these recitations are accepted is because they were correctly attributed to Rasulullah and they were mass transmitted. So according to Farid, these ayah of disagreement, which the scholars debate about, that we find in the 10 different Qur'a, they are tawata, they are mass transmitted from a chain of succession to the point where no one can reasonably argue they did not go back to Muhammad, or that someone introduced a lie, or someone changed, or something wasn't preserved, for example. Well, that's an interesting perspective, Farid. Let's see what scholar Marin Van Putin has to say about this. So Marin Van Putin has his own blog, and he published this article in September of 2023, and it says, Wata al Qur'a according to Ibn al Jazari. Now, Ibn al Jazari is one of the people that standardized the Qur'a into 10 canonical readings instead of 7 in the 15th century. Now, Marin Van Putin actually translates part of al Jazari's work where he talks about the requirements for valid canonical Qur'a readings. He translates his work as following The pillars of valid recitation. Each reading follows the grammatical rules of Arabic, even if just in some aspect, and follows one of the Uthmanic codices. Remember, it's codices because technically there is not a single Uthmanic codex. Each of the one he sent out to the different cities have variants in them. Even if it only permits it, is sound in its chain of transmission. Now let's read this. This is valid recitation, which is not allowed to refute and not valid to be denied. Indeed, it is from the seven Aruf, which the Quran was revealed by, and it is acceptable to follow it whether it is from the seven imams or the ten or some others from the accepted imams. And when one of these three pillars is lacking, it is dispatched of as weak, daif, unusual, sad, or invalid, regardless of whether it is from the seven or from a monk who is the greatest of them. Now, al Jazari seems to be quite a clever guy because he realized that if you said the requirement is tawata for all of these ayah of disagreement that we find in the Qur'at, you ultimately make a big problem. On the one hand, you want to say that everything is mass transmitted so there can be no doubt, and you affirm, therefore, that Muhammad actually said that. But the other problem is, is that you don't want to ascribe things to Muhammad that are not supposed to come from Muhammad. For example, Muhammad is supposed to be giving correct Arabic grammar, because this is a recitation from Allah, and so is divine, so it can't have incorrect grammar. It can't be nonsense, for example. But it also has to come from the Uthmanic Codex, because if it 
doesn't come from the Uthmanic Codex, then that means the caliph who standardized the Quran 20 years after Muhammad was a big fat liar. So there are now mechanisms in place that you have to conform to, not just the idea that it was mass transmitted. And al-Jazari seems to understand this as we continue reading. Ibn al-Jazari is channeling a view that was clearly around with earlier authorities, including the canonizer of the seven. Ibn Mujahid from the 10th century, who would frequently dismiss canonical readings that he described themselves and had a perfectly valid chain of transmission because he considered the grammar to be unacceptable, for example. So even in the case of Ibn Mujahid, 500 years before Al-Jazari, we see people looking at different readings and saying, wait, even though this has a sound chain of narration, it's just Ahad, a singular chain, we can't accept it because the Arabic is just completely wrong and we can't ascribe that to Muhammad. Let's keep reading. As for our words is sound in transmission, we mean by it an honest and trustworthy person transmitted this reading tradition from someone who was likewise continuing like that until you arrive and you are with someone well known among the Imams that are dependable on this matter without counting among them anything of fault or from among what is considered unusual with some of them. Some modern authors required Tawata for this pillar, and it is not enough for it to just have a sound train of transmission. They claim that the Quran can only be established by Tawata, and that which comes in a single strand of transmission, an Ahad chain of transmission, does not establish the Quran. It's obvious what this implies. If Tawata would establish soundness, then we would not need the other two requirements, that is, adherence to the Uthmanic codices and the other one, adherence to proper grammar, if the words of disagreement were established to come from the Prophet by Tawata, then we would be required to follow it, as it would be certain that it would be the Quran, regardless of whether it followed the Uthmanic text or differed from it. And if we would require Tawata of all the words among the words of disagreement that are established from these seven imams, the seven canonical readers, and others besides them, would be rejected. I used to incline towards this opinion, but then its wrongness became clear to me. Following the Imams of the first generation, the Salaf and those who follow the Halaf, is the better option. That is just amazing. There's so much in there. Let's, let's see how Marian Van Putin summarizes this. The laconic dismissal of the requirement of Tawata leads to what Ibn al-Jazari considers a logical absurdity. If it is really true that transmission needs to be so massive that nobody could disagree on its truth, then the other two pillars become absurd. The Uthmanic text postdates the Prophet. If there was a mass transmission of a reading that didn't follow Uthmanic Codex, you could obviously not dismiss such a purely hypothetical reading just because it doesn't follow a written text that did not exist at the time of the Prophet. That's the whole point of Tawata. Even more explicit, Ibn al-Jazari was perhaps embarrassed to have to point out just how heretical the claim was. If there really is Tawata, the requirement of sound grammar becomes nonsensical. If there was Tawata as a Muslim, one would have to accept it as certainly from the Prophet, and by extension that it is the literal word of God. And then this requirement is supposed to mean that this reading be, reject be subjected to the question of whether or not it agrees with the grammar of Arabic. Are Muslims to be the school teachers of God checking his Arabic? Let's continue reading. This becomes especially difficult in the case of unique readings. Among the 20 canonical transmitters of the 10 canonical readers, only the now dominant Hafs reads that specific word in Arabic. In Surah Al-Iqlas, Surah 112, Ayah 4, all others read differently. This doesn't change massively if we start including change of tr transmission outside of the 20 canonical transmitters. In other words, this reading is isolated, and the transmission of Hafs was not such a prolific teacher, and his chain of transmission does not go back to a huge number of companions of the Prophet. Logically, Tawata cannot be claimed for such a point of disagreement. Ibn al-Jazari understood this. Even in practical terms, this is clear. The great exegete al-Tabari, who was writing again in the 10th century, does not seem to show any awareness of readings that are unique to Hafs, while he is well aware of different readings, and cites them extensively in his exegesis. Is that what a reading that is so massively transmitted that nobody could not know what it looks like? No, of course not. In other words, even the great exegesis Al-Tabari in the 10th century wasn't aware of unique readings in some of the Qur'at, like the most dominant one today. And Al-Jazari's whole argument is that no, it's not Tawata, it is not mass transmission in any sense of the term, and that Muslims should stop saying that. If the scholar that is responsible for the 10 canonical readings argues that you shouldn't have mass transmission because you simply don't have mass transmission, then I'm just going to say you don't have mass transmission. <laughs> Which seems to be Marian Van Putin's point as well. These are the the base claims that Farid makes in his video, and yet it raises many more questions than it answers. It's incredibly problematic, and ultimately it's a form of innovation because this stuff does not go back to Muhammad. Muhammad never told them any of this. He simply said that it was revealed in seven different modes. 
But how do you get to 10 different kilat or 14 different kilat if you want to think about it historically? How do you get to that from seven different readings? Can you explain that in every place? And can you provide proof for it? I don't think you can, Farid. And I'll be very interested to see if you can. But as always, from my point of view, this is just an error. It's a desperate attempt to keep perfect preservation alive and well, even when that ship has long gone. No one, I think, in academia from a purely objective basis thinks the Quran is perfectly preserved. The average person doesn't think the Quran is perfectly preserved. And I think most Muslims don't really believe the Quran is perfectly preserved. The doctrine of perfect preservation is irrational and makes no sense. Muslims, you should come to a better belief, a better religion, a better worldview, where you are loved regardless of where you stand right now. God, Christ, calls you back home to him. He knows you from before you were born and he draws you to him. Turn away from Muhammad, look towards Jesus Christ. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. Take care.